Hi everyone. Um, in this video, I'm going to be um, explaining how to do problems five and six on your solving trig equations handout. Um, these are part of the first type of trig equations where the angle inside the trig function is by itself. Um, so like an X or a theta, not a two X or a two theta. And you can see that's the case in both number five and number six. Um, however, unlike the ones that we had done in our last class, um, there is more than one type of trig function in the problem. So like number five has both a sine and a cosine and number six has both a cotangent and a cosine. Um, previously, we had seen problems that were just sines or just cosines or just had one thing. Um, so when you're in a situation where you have more than one type of trig function, um, the first thing that you're going to want to do is try to use identities to get either just one type or at least less types. So for example, if we looked at number five, again, I see that it has a sine squared term and it also has a cosine term. And so what I need to think is my options here would either be to try to turn the sine squared into cosine or to try to turn the cosine into something with sines. So we don't have any identities that relate sine and cosine when they're not squared, which means we definitely, but we do have identities, the Pythagorean ones that relate sine squared to cosines when we have the squares. So we definitely want to change um, the sine squared x, not the cosine. Um, and we know that by manipulating one of the Pythagorean identities, the original one, sine squared theta is the same thing as cos one minus cosine squared theta, or in this case, x. So I would rewrite my equation as two parentheses, one minus cosine squared x equals three cosine x. And now once I have done that and I have everything in terms of cosine, it actually shouldn't be too complicated to solve. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, distribute to remove my parentheses. And I'm going to notice that because there is that squared term on the cosine, it's not going to be possible to isolate cosine because there's cosine squared and a cosine. So what I'm going to need to do is set this equation equal to zero and factor. I notice that my um, squared term is currently negative, the negative two cosine squared X. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move all the terms over to the right side to keep my squared term positive. So I'm going to say two cosine squared X minus three cosine X uh, minus two. And I wrote them in that order so that it was in standard form, the squared, the linear, and then the constant term. Now, at this point that it's set equal to zero, I'm going to factor with the cosines. Um, and since, so since I see that there's a leading coefficient that's not one, I know that I'm going to have to have my first factor be two cosine X and my second one be just a regular cosine X. Um, and then I see that my constant term is a negative two. So that means that I'm probably, I'm going to have a plus and a minus and a one and a two. So I need to decide what, um, what's going to work. So what I'm noticing here is that if I were to put the minus two right here, this minus two is going to multiply with the two on the front to make a negative four. And the reason that I noted that as significant was then if I do the one as positive and put that right there, that's gonna multiply with the one cosine. And so that two times the negative two makes a negative four, add on that one cosine, and I've got the negative three cosine that I need in the middle. Um, so these, fact these two factors are going to work. Um, once I have it factored, then my next step is to set each um, factor equal to zero. Uh, basically creating two mini equations. So I have two cosine X plus one equals zero and then cosine X minus two equals zero. Um, and now I'm just going to take a second to solve each of these little equations. So for my first one, if I isolate the cosine, I'm going to get that cosine X equals negative a half. And if I just draw a little picture to help myself visualize this, I know that cosine is negative in the second quadrant and the third quadrant. So I'm gonna get two answers. Um, and I also know, um, if I just zoom in a little bit here, if it's negative a half, that puts the um, two on the hypotenuse and the negative one as my adjacent, which means root three is gonna be the opposite. And the angle that has root three opposite from it is pi over three. So what this means is that in the second quadrant, the angle with a pi over three reference angle is two pi over three. And in the third quadrant, that would be four pi over three. Um, so those are the two answers to that mini equation. However, I do also need to go over here to solve my second mini equation. Um, so isolating the cosine, I get cosine X equals two. Um, however, when I see that cosine X equals two, I'm automatically suspicious because if I were to draw a similar little picture of this, um, cosine would normally be positive in the first and the fourth. Um, what two is telling me is that the adjacent is two and the hypotenuse is one, which is impossible. 
Um, you could also think about the fact that the range of the cosine function goes from negative one to one um, because the hypotenuse is supposed to be biggest, um, the largest the cosine value can ever get is one. So if you ever see a cosine value greater than one or less than negative one, um, that's not possible. So we're gonna get no solutions from this part of the equation. Um, that doesn't mean that the solution to the equation is no solution because we did still get the two answers from the first part. So this one just has two answers from here and there are none from that second part. Um, so just to finish um, with a full view of this problem, um, you can see that we used an identity to change the sine squared into one minus cosine squared, which allowed us to have one trig function throughout so we could factor and then set the factors equal to zero. Um, one factor did give us two answers um, in a way that should be familiar, but the second factor, um, because it was saying the cosine value was two, was not possible because cosine values are always between negative one and one inclusive. Um, that would be the same for sine. So in another problem, if you saw um, sine equals two, for example, that would be another situation where it was not possible. So we got no extra solutions from that second uh, factor. Um, now that we finished number five, we're going to move on to number six. Um, so number six has cotangent equals two cosine x. Um, so we don't really have a way to turn cosine into cotangent, but what we can say is that cotangent is cosine over sine. Um, so I'm going to start by rewriting um, my cotangent function as cosine x over sine x equals two cosine x. And so in this one, you might be saying, well, you did rewrite that, but we're not in a situation where that made us have only one trig function. Um, however, I would say that it has less types of trig functions. And it might be difficult to see at this point why this is helpful, but basically what I'm thinking is that cotangent and cosine don't really play nicely together. They don't have a lot of relationships, um, but sine and cosine tend to play better together. Um, so now we have just sines and cosines, and maybe we'll be able to do something with the fact that part of the cotangent turned into a cosine to match the cosine that we already had. So similar to number five, um, once you have done something with an identity, um, it's going to be time to solve this equation according to the way that you normally would. So if I was going to um, solve an equation that involved a fraction, um, the first thing I would do would be to try to clear out that fraction. So in this case, I'm going to multiply both sides by sine x. So it's going to cancel over here. And when I multiply this side by sine x, um, my equation will look like cosine x equals two cosine x times sine x. Now, because we have cosines and sines in this equation, we are not going to be able to isolate a trig function because there's just two different types. So what you want to keep in mind is that anytime you can't isolate the trig function, what you're going to want to do is set the equation equal to zero and factor. It's either isolate or a factor. So that's going to be my next step. Now, in this case, because there's no quadratic term, I don't really think it matters which side you decide to set it equal to zero on. You could pull the two cosine sine term over to the left or pull the cosine term over to the right. Um, since I did it on the right in the last problem, I think I'll pull everything over on the left side in this problem. So this is just gonna be by subtracting. And so since we set equal to zero, now we have to factor. Now in this one, because it's not quadratic, we're not gonna be doing the kind of factoring where we look for our two parentheses and think about what multiplies to the constant and adds to the linear term. We're just gonna be factoring out a common factor because what I notice is that in, um, what I, in my purple, I have a cosine in each term. So I'm able to factor out a cosine X in the from the first term and the second term. So if I factor cosine out of cosine, I just get one. And if I factor out of two cosine sine, I get two, um, two sine X and then that equals zero. Then um, just like in our previous problem, what we can do is set each factor equal to zero. So for the cosine, that's just going to mean setting cosine X equal to zero. And then it'll be one minus two sine X equals zero. Um, and then we need to figure out which angles on zero to two pi work here. Um, so for cosine X equals zero, um, since it's a zero, I know that's gonna be a quadrantal angle. And I know that cosine refers to X. So I'm gonna be looking for when X is zero. So X is zero on the positive Y axis and also on the negative Y axis. So I would have two answers here. Um, one is pi over two, and the other one is three pi over two. Um, remember, you can't use like the negative versions because we're saying uh, we're solving on zero to two pi. Um, similarly, for the next one, I'm gonna start by isolating sine since it's not isolated. So if I subtract like this, I've got a negative one over here, and then sine x is equal to a half. And so for that, I'm gonna just draw a little picture to remind myself sine is positive in the first and the second quadrant. And I also know, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so I can draw better here. Um, sine means opposite over hypotenuse, which means that the adjacent is right here as a root three. 
And I know that the angle with that one on the opposite is pi over six. Um, therefore, I can tell that my x values are in the first quadrant, pi over six. And in the second quadrant, the angle with a reference angle of pi over six would be five pi over six. So this equation actually has four answers. Um, and they are pi over two and three pi over two from the first factor and pi over six and five pi over six from the second factor. So each factor could give two, one, or zero um, solutions altogether. Um, and so you could have a variety of different numbers in each equation. But the big thing you wanna remember is that if you don't have just one type of trig function, your first step is going to be to use an identity. And then frequently after that, you're going to want to factor. And you especially wanna remember about factoring um, in a situation like in number six, where what we're doing is we're factoring out a common factor. Um, sometimes it can be easy to forget to do that, but um, it's an important strategy to make sure that you end up getting the right answers. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in our next class.